Thanks everyone for joining us at the Project Censored radio show. We're very glad right now to be joined by Professor Mohamed Bamier, who's a from from who's from the Department of Sociology at the University of Pittsburgh and is the author of Anarchy as Order: The History and Future of Civil Humanity. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to start with some history to contextualize the idea of a no state solution as something that's not at all uh, alien, particularly for the region in which Palestine is. And what struck me when you were talking about it was actually the West African idea of Sankofa, which is the bringing forward of an idea from a people's own history. And I was wondering if you could just start by talking a little bit about how the no state solution is already woven in to the cultural and historical fabric of Palestinians and also the larger region? Sure. Uh, the Palestinians, as you know, do not have a state uh, of their own. Uh, and uh, for a long time, of course, the emancipation of the Palestinians had been conceived or imagined in the form of a state that is independent. Uh, and that is fine, actually. I have no problem with that. Uh, and in fact, I have always supported the kind of uh, Palestinian sovereignty. Uh, especially if it involves kind of freedom of occupation uh, and ability to determine uh, the future on their own. Uh, the uh, fundamental problem is that uh, for uh, most of their histories, Palestinians actually have accommodated themselves to living without a state. Right? Uh, and they have rebuilt their society in the diaspora after 1948, uh, both in the refugee camps uh, as well as through organizations that they formed as well as in civil society that they built across the world in the diaspora, all of that without a state. Uh, now, uh, Palestinians actually are not alone uh, here, because if you look at the entire region of that we today call the Middle East, uh, you also see that um, uh, for most of the history of the region, uh, people have actually also lived without a state, even though they were, when they were governed formally by states, uh, but most social life was actually uh, kind of organized according to traditions uh, that were voluntary accepted, uh, that were mutually understandable by the people. Uh, and that was also the case in the time of empires. Uh, the only exception was uh, in the modern uh, states when they were kind of imposed in the region. Uh, and after World War One in particular, uh, and those states were, for the most part, imposed by colonial powers. Uh, not They did not emerge out of organic process of state building from below, uh, nor as an outcome of actually people's uh, desire. Uh, and, uh, and those states basically continue to exist until today. Uh, they were tolerated for a while uh, in the post-independence period because there was a hope that uh, these states were of a modern nature uh, they would undertake developmental projects uh, that were help a kind of people uh, kind of uh, become prosperous uh, and free uh, and sovereign. Uh, and for a while, for a few decades, uh, that kind of a promise kind of was a sort of uh, kind of uh, believed in by many people in the region uh, until we hit the neoliberal era, uh, beginning with the 1990s in some places earlier, uh, where in fact states went back to what they had always done historically, which is to do little or nothing for most people. And uh, so we are, uh, so essentially social life continued basically to evolve in the Middle East for the most part outside uh, of the realm of the state and independent of the state and people take care of each other basically through again traditions uh, of mutual help, uh, uh, conflict management, uh, et cetera, that are known to them uh, at the local level. Uh, so basically, from my point of view, uh, and uh, and if you link up to the war that's going on in, in Gaza, as well as the war in Syria, uh, the war in Libya, uh, etc., right? uh, all these wars that are raging uh, in the region, uh, it becomes clear that the Maha state, the Israel included, uh, are simply murder machines. Right? Uh, they are there to serve themselves as states uh, and their elites uh, and no one else. Uh, and uh, pretty much uh, they go to war against people that they control uh, or against each other as a matter of course because of the way they are designed. Uh, they are designed essentially as competitors, ultimately. Uh, and, uh, and they see themselves, each other as such. Right? Uh, and they see their population also as a threat. But, uh, I don't mean the population that is only the citizens right, uh, of those states, uh, but also the population that they control as a whole, basically. Uh, 
So in the case of Israel, that would be including the Palestinians basically as part of the population uh, that lives also under uh, the control of the state of Israel, and that is considered to be by the state of Israel to be an enemy of the state in the, in the whole population. Uh, so uh, when you look at this history, you realize that first, uh, the state, state and society in the Middle East are two distinct things. Uh, they are often at odds with each other. Um, uh, genocide, uh, ethnic cleansing uh, is part of the history we're talking about. Uh, and essentially, states are superfluous. I mean, we can live without them. Uh, we actually have done that without them. Uh, so it's not as though uh, the idea of the no-state solution is something that is strange uh, and far-fetched idea. It actually does represent the historical and the ongoing kind of reality of social organization in the region. Yeah, thank you so much for that historical mm -hmm. context. And, I, and I'm curious then, with the idea uh, of a Palestinian state, do you feel that it's possible to create a Palestinian state uh, that is not that doesn't fall prey to the same issues that you just mentioned, or is it impossible because a state as a colonialist uh, and violent construct will always ha have those problems, even if it is created in order to uh, push for the liberation of a Palestinian people? I mean, if a state, if a Palestinian state comes into existence, uh, I think that will be an improvement over the occupation. Right? So it's not as though... <laughs> Uh, that uh, that the no state solution is the only st solution uh, that is uh, that would improve uh, the conditions that we have right now. Uh, uh, a two state solution would be an improvement over the occupation. Uh, a one state solution in Israel Palestine would also be an improvement of, over the two state solution uh, because it would not require population movements. It would not require. Uh, sort of uh, all kinds of uh, unrealistic adjustments uh, to the way people live, uh, and it will be democratic and humane, ultimately. But neither the two-state solution nor the one-state solution seem to be practical from today's point of view uh, or acceptable because of the, uh, not just because of uh, the way the Israeli state itself is, has been constructed, uh, but also because the kind of the international kind of community uh, is not willing actually to exert the kind of political capital and the kind of pressure that will be required to force either of those uh, solutions. Uh, so uh, I am actually not opposed to an independent uh, uh, Palestinian state, and I would be happy uh, if that were to happen. Uh, I just don't see this to be a realistic uh, thing. Uh, Palestinian, ultimately, it is the Palestinians right, who have to decide, uh, or who have to be given an opportunity right, uh, to decide uh, about their future uh, in a sovereign kind of way. Right? Uh, so that's, that's where I would leave it. Uh, and I'm basically putting the no state solution ultimately as another kind of uh, solution to think about, which is actually in the long run, uh, this is not something that will happen tomorrow, of course, right? uh, but in the long run uh, would be actually adjustment to the, to the continuous failures of the states uh, as we have experienced them. So. Yeah. And I'm also curious because you 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 mentioned, of mm -hmm. course, the, the 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 myriad issues with statehood. Uh, but you also mentioned that the strengthening of the diaspora and the building of uh, identity and uh, mm -hmm. Palestinian identity and collective selfhood all done without a state. Um, mm -hmm. And very ironically, I have also felt the the Jewish identity is similar that we have a strong identity and a sense of self, uh, not mm -hmm. in spite of not having a state prior to 1948, but indeed because we do not. And now that there is one, in fact, I feel that the Jewish identity is ripping uh, because of it. Um, and you you mentioned in a previous, in a, in a recent presentation that uh, when we emancipate ourselves from this commitment to a national identity, that due to oppression and resistance to it has become our primary defining feature, this is what liberation looks like. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how statehood actually deflates and kind of denies a collective selfhood um, and a rich culture of multiple identities and in many ways becomes kind of like a set of collective shackles. Uh, I think a state, uh, especially a state that is based on uh, collective national identity at, uh, as a stand-in for that national identity, uh, rigidifies that identity. That uh, makes it a lot more rigid uh, than otherwise it would be. Uh, so if you, if I say that I'm a Palestinian or an Arab or a Jew or whatever it is uh, uh, that, uh, uh, but I don't have a state to actually 
represent kind of and stand in for that identity kind of i have a lot more freedom basically with that with the word deposit that identity hopefully. uh of course the formula is very different uh, when you have a state that says i represent you as a nation uh, and you owe loyalty to me primarily uh, and all other potential loyalties you have to actually get rid of and national conflicts emerged out of that uh, kind of uh, setup that uh, that we have considered ourselves uh, so in the historical Middle East, you had large Jewish communities throughout the history of the Middle East, huh? in Iraq, in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, throughout North Africa, especially Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, all that, all of those uh, places were full of Jewish communities that lived well with the Muslim majority right? Right? and had their own rights and they could live according to their own laws. Right? Uh, none of those people... Uh, went to Palestine, basically, it was the, the Holy Land all these times before 1948, right? uh, because even though there was nothing to prevent them from doing so, ultimately. Uh, so if you look at the history of uh, coexistence at, uh, of various types of communities like uh, throughout the region, uh, you notice that actually uh, the thing that made these relationships kind of warlike, basically, was in fact uh, the idea of, uh, that each nation had to create its own exclusive community, uh, which meant ethnic cleansing. You have to move people uh, out of the territory you conclude, or you have to take rights away from them. Of course, that causes unhappiness, problems of security right, uh, that come out of that, and war. Right? As All of that has happened, ultimately. Uh, so it's uh, so I think actually that I don't have actually a problem uh, with people having any specific identity and be attached to it in particular, uh, so long as there is no power structure that, that actually uh, deposits that identity into a violent system and uh, put it in contrast and against other types of identities in the same region. This is what we have right now. And this is, in fact, a fundamental factor behind the genocide uh, that is happening in Gaza right, right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, while you were talking, I was thinking a little bit about uh, the the Umayyad ca uh, Caliphate in Al-Andalus in southern Spain, which was technically under the yoke of the Abbasids who were then governing from Baghdad. But in reality, they had their own form of governance, their own laws, and Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived uh, together without a problem, basically until Ferdinand and Isabella came to power. And then uh, what we know is the Inquisition and everything uh, kicked off. So when it was under under the the, the Muslim control, technically, uh, these the these people were able to live together without issues, um, and then as you said, it the, the, you had to create the other, and you had to create those distinctions. Um, I I want I want to dig into something that you've also discussed, and I really liked the way that you you framed this, uh, what you call organic anarchism. Um, an anarchist method of rebellion that seems to be ingrained in familiar social traditions. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, this organic anarchism? Because anarchy is something that you've also discussed and how this uh, kind of uh, moves itself towards a no-state solution and how this has shown itself uh, to, to work within the Palestinian communities. Uh, when I uh, began to think about uh, what became my book, uh, Anarchy as Order, actually, I sketched uh, there are two types of anarchy that uh, that I was concerned. One was was the one the one was the self conscious anarchism, the anarchist movement uh, that begins with the Enlightenment, in fact, in, Enlightenment thought, uh, and becomes an organized movement in, in Europe as of the mid nineteenth century and continues to be with us until today. Ultimately, self conscious anarchism. But I thought actually there is a, a larger social, global history of anarchism uh, that is not uh, that has uh, little to do with the self-conscious anarchism, uh, and namely that is uh, the large cluster of autonomous, self-organized uh, societies right, uh, that live underneath the state, uh, but they have their own systems. Uh, and this is something that, uh, that my book actually tried to actually document historically that I'm talking about. Uh, not only in terms of social organizations historically, uh, before colonialism in particular, uh, but also in terms of social philosophies uh, that you see in the Muslim world, I mean, political philosophies that you see in the Muslim world, uh, in the Hindu world, uh, also in medieval Europe. Or you even see it in Machiavelli as well, uh, by the way, where uh, the fundamental uh, point is that state and society have nothing to do with each other. 
that the state has its own logic, its own kind of uh, uh, way of thinking. Uh, it is own systems of management and rule. And society has its own uh, kind of ways of organizing itself. Uh, that is something that you see across all these political philosophies across the world as well. That reflect, in fact, the, the, the awareness of historical kind of uh, political philosophers across various civilization or the fact that society has its own kind of organization model and so the state has its own mind, to speak right. And that is the word the idea of organic anarchism kind of comes in. So, uh, and the anarchism that is done by millions of people who actually have not read any books about anarchism. Uh, they may not even know what the term means, right? Uh, but practically, their life is kind of organized around uh, mutual help, basically, uh, solidarity, uh, known conflict management uh, um, uh, solutions. Uh, typically, they have very little in the way of prisons, for example, of course, of apparatuses. These are used by the state, but not really by society. Uh, and uh, and you see it in 2011 and 2019 in the Arab world, in the Arab uprising movement, right? uh, where in fact you have revolutions of a new kind that had no leadership, that had no organization behind them, uh, and uh, that uh, seemed to not, nonetheless be able to mobilize millions of people. And that, in my analysis, of course, of those revolutions, that, those, that style of doing revolution comes out of already known way of mobilizing and, and spontaneous action and so on. And, and that was, uh, relatively speaking, a new way that was reawakened a familiar, familiar social traditions and mobilized them in, in a revolutionary direction. That's, so we haven't had that actually before where kind of this organic anarchism that I'm talking about actually becoming uh, an, an incendiary material for revolution. Uh, that is relatively new. And that is the era I think we are going because if you look at other kind of uh, protest movements around the world since 2011, you also see similar features. They may be smaller in other parts of the world, but they have the same features like a uh, loose network of activists, uh, not centrally organized, spontaneity being an art of movement. They speak in the, in the name of the people as a whole or the 99% or something like that, but not in the name of uh, something like the working class or any specific group. To speak of. So organic anarchism uh, is part of social traditions everywhere, historically speaking, right? Uh, and right now is is being reawakened. I think right. Uh, that is, uh, it is not again. It is not called anarchism, right? Uh, by the people who actually do it, uh, but it does have a clearly a kind of a lot of similarity to. Uh, what uh, the philosophical kind of self-conscious anarchist kind of tradition uh, does say. And one more point about this is that uh, when we talk about organic anarchism, uh, I think it is uh, in the minds of uh, most people whom I describe as such, uh, it is mixed in with other elements. So it's not as though this is actually pure ideology, so to speak, right? Um, and that is, uh, for example, you have, uh, you have lots of people in Egypt, for example, uh, or Tunisia, uh, who actually do rely on each other, uh, live uh, a pattern of everyday life that may be considered to be organically anarchist, uh, but also uh, at other points, they may have no problem with something uh, that we call um, enlightened despotism, for example, of someone who comes in uh, and promises to help uh, solve problems, uh, is perhaps given a chance to do so. Right? So we are talking about when we talk about organic anarchism, we are also talking about uh, social ideology that is also mixed with other ideology in the same mind. Right? Over time, of course, uh, the difference between uh, these way different types of thinking about governing a social life become more and more kind of distinct from each other with experience. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And I'm curious how how you would see, for instance, the intifadas as, uh, would you see those as an example of organic anarchism? Exactly. Yeah, I talk about especially the first intifada right, as a good example of that. Uh, and it is actually the first, um, uh, and especially in uh, uh, the larger Middle Eastern history. Um, uh, of uh, of an event like that, uh, we had, of course, Palestinian resistance movement, 
uh, that was organized and happened uh, before uh, in 1987 when the Intifada broke. Uh, but the first Intifada was had the same characteristic that you see in 2011. Uh, namely, it has a spontaneous character, it was collective. Um, it did not have, at the beginning at least, did not really have a leadership behind it. Uh, and it happened at a time when the PLO uh, was very weak, in fact, was sitting in exile in Tunisia, right? it had very little effect on anything that was happening in Palestine. Uh, the Arab world had forgotten about Palestine by that, at that point as well. It was busy with the Iran-Iraq war. That was the main concern for, uh, for all Arab governments at that point. Uh, so the Palestinians felt abandoned completely at that point and weak. Right? And precisely at that point, you have sort of this, anarch this organic anarchist social capital right? exploding in the form of a revolution that, that we call the Intifada. Right? Uh, and so the uh, the uh, the advantage I think right, uh, of this organic anarchist culture right uh, is that it provides a way for people to mobilize with each other uh, using social traditions and at times when their social or when their organizations uh, are weak when their leadership is absent right, or irrelevant to this speak right? but their grievances are still there. So actually, they have to do something, right? and they do it with the help of whatever cultural resources that happen to be available to them. And that has happened earlier, of course, uh, in uh, Palestinian history, uh, not in the form of intifada, but in other in forms of actually maintaining uh, kind of uh, Palestinian society uh, alive and well connected. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I, I want to dig into something also that you that you had uh, spoken about in a previous presentation, which is uh, the idea of uh, the issue of religio religiosity. Um, and you'd spoken before about what we what we call here fundamentalist Islam being an outgrowth of colonialist violence, basically, uh, that it's not something that comes from these organic uh, shared social and communal traditions. Um, and in that sense, uh, to me, it felt a bit a bit like how we talk about how the U.S. is responsible basically, basically for the creation of ISIS uh, or the U.S.'s strong ties to Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia, not least of all having uh, Osama bin Laden on the CIA's payroll. Is that like, could you talk a little bit more about how the how these fundamentalist uh, um, uh, movements are actually outgrowths of that colonialist violence? Well, they are. Uh, there are different origins of fundamentalisms. So it's not actually the, all the first thing. That's the same thing. Right? Uh, so part of it has to do with uh, with the kind of fundamentalism that you see first established in places like Saudi Arabia. Right? Um, and that fundamentalism was part of the state building project in a place like Saudi Arabia, where uh, where it's it had to be imposed by force. Right? Uh, that is fundamentalism, uh, the Wahhabism, in fact, the Wahhabi version of it, uh, always relied on uh, state force to impose it on the population. It was not something that people believed in voluntarily. Right? Of course, every time you see if a phenomenon like that, a, type, a, a variety of religion that requires force to be imposed, you know that it is weakly rooted in society. Right? Otherwise, uh, force will not be will not will not be necessary. Uh, later on, you have another variety of fundamentalism that also comes from the ground up. Uh, that is not necessarily related to state, but actually often is an opposition to the state, ultimately. And that is something that you see when you have uh, social problems or political problems that persist and no one is resolving them. Uh, for example, Hamas. In 1948, there was no Hamas. In 1967, uh, there was no Hamas either. Uh, it took 40 years right, uh, of basically constant repression of the Palestinians for something like Hamas to emerge and say, okay, well, these secular forces have not resolved your problem, right? So here is one force within your own tradition uh, that could help you. Right? Uh, so fundamentalism, or what we call fundamentalism, actually is not a natural outgrowth of any, especially when it comes from below. Right? That is, It is not really something that uh, that that simply burst out without lots of social problems that no one else have been able to actually deal with, kind of um, managed. Uh, 
so it is uh, and elsewhere in the region you see that as well so basically the uh, the post independence period uh, in most arab countries there was actually no fundamentalism anywhere uh, the post colonial elite both political and cultural elite were entirely secular up until the late 70s right? um uh, the founder and then of course the uh, in 1979 you have the iranian revolution uh, which is impressive to a lot of people because that is the first time where Islam actually is mobilized in a revolutionary direction. As and and a lot of people who were before before that were secular uh, and had no connection to religion uh, begin to think that maybe religion actually is our way out of this mess. Uh, for example, uh, the founder of the Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Uh, in 1979, actually was a Nasserite pan-Arabist nationalist. He had no connection to Islam at all. Right? Uh, but then he saw Khomeini being successful in Iran and said, well, uh, this could work. So this is uh, what, so basically uh, uh, fundamentalism often emerges out of this pragmatic right, kind of search for solutions right? uh, and an experimental way, basically, right? until, of course, the fundamentalist solution itself uh, fails, in which case it gives her to another type, uh, another type of ideology, right? so long as the problem is there and requires to be resolved, solved by someone right, who can promise to have an effective way of doing it. Right? Um, uh, that actually goes, there's an older kind of version of everything that I just described, uh, that is, in the early phases of colonialism uh, in the Middle East, uh, there was a debate uh, uh, between uh, in Arab intellectual circles about uh, what caused uh, our, uh, say, as they call it, backwardness. Uh, uh, so the secular nationalists would say it was colonialism. Colonialism is the problem, and we have to fight colonialism. Uh, those who, uh, who, who were more religious argued no. Uh, the problem is uh, colonialism came to us because we were weak, and we became weak. We have because we had abandoned our we have abandoned our tradition, and therefore we have to go back and strengthen ourselves through our traditions. And that is how you get rid of fundamentalism right? by reawakening your culture. And that debate continues until today, practically. Right? Uh, uh, so in a way, it is not as though fundamentalism in either case was the only uh, kind of uh, answer there, but it is one of the range of possible kind of answers to persisting problems. Right? Yeah, and it, I mean, what you're describing sounds a lot like what we see here in the US, the the Christian mm -hmm. fundamentalists who say we have to go back to this this past mm -hmm. where, you know, where the, we have these problems because we've strayed from the path, you know, mm -hmm. like that whole, uh, it, it, it seems like it's the same. Sure. The, the 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 same script um so uh, wrapping up here Mohammed I'd really like to to talk about talk to you about your perspectives on reality and realism uh, because mm -hmm. I found that to be a really fascinating and important argument that you made that when realism as a perspective is useless and re when reality is unacceptable you have to go beyond and i'm curious here also like about the conversation about utopia because uh utopia literally translates to no place um and i've often felt that aiming for a utopia is largely a pointless endeavor but rather to imagine worlds that not only can exist but perhaps already do and and have existed so could you talk a little bit about that uh, that that argument that you've made about realism and reality and going beyond. Uh, yeah, sure. I think that's an important point because uh, the uh, the problem that we have in Israel Palestine uh, is because uh, the realist solutions um, uh, are not working and 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 they cannot work. Uh, the and there's a lot of history uh, behind uh, why uh, they cannot work. Uh, now, the, that means actually this reality uh, that's producing genocide today uh, is unacceptable. Uh, and that the realists, meaning that the diplomats, uh, those who think within the parameters of the states, uh, actually have become useless people. Uh, now, so that, that means that we have to actually look beyond reality uh, and we have to look at historical example uh, where we have all kinds of revolutions, the Bolsheviks, Khomeini, etc. Uh, 
the Palestinian resistance movement itself, all of which uh, were kind of uh, undertaken by unrealistic people, to speak right. Uh, why do the weak attack the strong? Uh, that is, uh, also, that happens, of course, but it is also unrealistic at, from the point of view of those who highlight realism. Uh, but that is how revolutions happen, right? by people who actually do not know whether they have a chance of success or not. Uh, but they have to act, so to speak. Uh, and uh, much of grand historical change has happened uh, really uh, that way, uh, not by uh, realistic people, people, but by people who had no connection to realism at all and rejected it. That does not mean that the result is always great. In fact, uh, in fact a lot of damage, of course, could result uh, from actually ignoring realism. Uh, but from a sociological point of view, I think what matters more is not uh, the result, but analyzing the situation to and to say actually in our history uh, and the global revolution history in particular, uh, lack of realism has been an important kind of uh, motivating factor. More so were will and vitality, basically, uh, rejecting reality altogether because it is not working. Right? Um, uh, that seemed to be a lot more important than having actually a clear plan and realistic mindset. So, yeah. uh, and so that's and that's where we are now, because ultimately, if you look at the fact uh, at what is happening in Gaza uh, right now, uh, we see a reality that is completely unacceptable. Right? Uh, and we see actually that people who are trying to think of a realistic way to solve that problem are themselves kind of unable to do anything about it. Right? Um, uh, so the so that is an opportunity, I think, to think beyond the limits of what exists, because what exists is unhelpful, basically, and not only unhelpful, but is also genocidal and criminal. To speak right. uh, and so that is where, and part, of course, of the way of thinking beyond reality and realism is the no-state solution, in, in my mind. Because that is really the kind of a time uh, when one has to think about something beyond what there, uh, what, what is possible. Now, I don't think uh, that is, uh, I don't actually, I do not want to present any of this as utopia. Um, the, uh, that's uh, because I don't think actually utopia is something that we can uh, arrive at, uh, but uh, uh, but we actually need to understand, I think, the, uh, the captivating power of the utopian imagination. Uh, uh, people go to revolutions uh, in mass in 2011, 2019. Uh, which is which are events that I have observed firsthand, uh, because they have a utopian imagination. Uh, that is, they don't have a plan, they don't know if the revolution is going to work, uh, but uh, they go into the revolution, and, and within that revolution, you ha they have a utopian experience that uh, that it is actually uh, the kind of camaraderie and solidarity and friendliness that they experience the revolution. Perhaps is the way future society is going to be after the revolution. That is what moves people. So it's not as though uh, what I'm describing here is going to lead to a utopia. Uh, I think it would lead to a much better reality than we have right now, but it is not utopia. <laughs> On the other hand, people who actually do reject reality and realism do often actually have this utopian impulse that keeps them going. And that is important enough for the revolutionary act. So it's kind of like a utopian hope that, that that's the fuel, sure. if not the goal. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, Mohammed Bamiye, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and uh and and lay out all of this important context and all of these ideas. Yeah. Again, the um uh, Mohammed Bami is the depart from the Department of Sociology at the University of Pittsburgh and is the author of Anarchy as Order, the History and Future of Civil Humanity. Mohammed, thank you again so much for joining us on the show. Mm -hmm.